Hello, and welcome to the webinar titled Equity Trading with MATLAB and Faxit. My name is Stuart Cazola, and I'm a product manager here at the MathWorks in charge of our computational finance products. Also with me today is Stephen Bappert. He is from Faxit, and he will be providing an overview of Faxit content as well as the integration with MATLAB. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the agenda for today. Today we're going to provide a brief overview of the Faxit content. Stephen Bappart will be doing that here in a moment, including the integration with MATLAB and the content that's available from Faxit that you can import into MATLAB. I will then be following Stephen's presentation and providing an overview of MATLAB, what MATLAB is and how you can develop financial models or financial analysis with that. In particular, we'll be looking at an event study around earnings per share announcements. And we'll also take a look at another example application where you can develop customized applications and share them with other users, including non-MATLAB users. An example there will be a simple portfolio optimization using mean variance or conditional value at risk optimization. And then we'll conclude the webinar with a final example that will show you how you can take example applications developed in MATLAB and deploy them to the web or other infrastructures. Okay, so at this point I'm going to go ahead and transition systems and let Steve begin his discussion about FactSet content. Thank you, Stuart. Hi, thank you for joining our presentation today. My name is Stephen Vappert, and I'm the FactSet Content Sales Specialist. Today, I'm going to touch on some of our unique content from FactSet Fundamentals and FactSet Estimates. This unique content will allow you to do research on more securities in a timelier manner and with more unique data sets than any other third-party fundamental and estimate provider. However, first, I'm going to touch a bit on FactSet and what we do. FactSet provides software tools and proprietary collected data needed to monitor global markets, analyze public and private companies, and equity and fixed income portfolios in a single convenient way. Looking at this slide here, you can see we were founded in 1978 and went public in 1996. Last year, we continued 15 straight years of growth by posting a 13% growth. FactSet has over 2,200 clients and 48,000 users both doubling in the past 10 years. And something we all take very serious and are quite proud of here at Faxit is their 95% annual client retention rate, meaning we want to partner with you for the long haul. Faxit works with all different types of clients and have specific product suites that cater to each client specific needs. Look at this slide again here, you can see some of the specific product suites we offer, whether you're an equity analyst, a fixed income analyst, or you need something more specific like our content and technology solutions, data feeds, um, we have solutions for pretty much anyone who wants to do analytical work. Moving along, you know, on this slide here, we really can see all the different facts that proprietary content that we offer. Our goal being to be a, a one-stop shop for you to do all the different type of analytical work you need to do throughout the course of the day. Some of our, our bigger products and our flagship stuff like facts at fundamentals, facts at estimates, events and transcripts, economics, all the way down to fixed income, M&A, and, and private company coverage. This is all the specific type of facts and proprietary content uh, that we provide. I'm going to jump specifically into two of our product sets that I, I really feel that we've done a lot of improvement to and have done a lot of investment to make this the most robust product and have some unique features that will really help our users and, and you all to really kind of power your models and do some unique testing. To give you a little background on what fact set fundamentals is all about, because a lot of people who have been in industry for a long time are really used to maybe some of the more kind of standard players who have been around forever. And fact set fundamentals really has only been around for the past three or four years. Where it came from was it was a copy of the Thompson and Reuters WorldScope database. When they merged, they were required to sell a copy. So Everything where facts that fundamentals came from, all of its history, came from a database that the market has been using for years and feels very comfortable with. Really, what we have done is make it, made it a lot better. And that's really what I'm going to show you in some of these slides coming up. To give you a little more background, they were required to give us a copy of the database for the two years. We were allowed to hire key members away, and they had to train our staff. So from day one, we were ready to go and do this collection. And as it says in the bottom here of this slide, in May of 2010, we've been collecting facts and fundamentals 100% ourselves. So now, you know, we're going on over three years here of collections with facts that doing uh, the collections. And I think in the next couple areas is really where it's going to kind of shine and what we are willing to do and what we've done to make this the most robust database. 
that our clients can use. Just a little background, our coverage has more than 73,000 public and private companies, and more than 47,000 of them are actively covered right now. And that equates to roughly more than 110 markets throughout the, the globe that we're covering. A little bit of the history. The annual history can go back to the 1980s. That tends to be more of the developed markets with the emergings go back to 1990. And our quarterly coverage goes back to 1998. As I had mentioned, this is all what we inherited from the WorldScope database. So if you're ever used to using that, this is on par with what's going on there. Moving on to what have we done that allow you to do more robust analysis than in the past is one of them is, is coverage. In the past three years since we took over in May of 2010, we've added over 12,600 new securities. And this is pretty much all primarily driven through client demand, listening to our clients who have been doing analytical work for years and wanting to go to maybe more you know, exotic areas or areas that are really kind of turning the market. As you can see, our regions are focused on the bottom you know, right out of the gate, we focused on Southeast Asia, you know, China, Korea, Vietnam, the Philippines, Thailand, all areas where people want to do a lot of investing. Next, we really focus on the Middle East and North Africa. And in this past year right now, really a lot of our kind of increased coverage is going based on what our clients want. You know, you as a user, where do you want to do investment? What are some areas that maybe you're not used to being able to get anywhere else? Taking that that demand and really driving where we want to continue to expand our coverage. And then a little bit of a little table here on the, on the right side of our, our screen, we can kind of see where our coverage breaks down and where kind of those, those 73,000 total coverage and, and 47,000 active companies are coming from. I think the second big thing that we've really done to make this an amazing database is really attack timeliness. Because our, our clients, whether they're you know, analyzing individual companies and trying to trade or trying to do quantitative back testing models or doing anything of that nature, they want to make sure they're seeing the most current information that exists there. Obviously, more current information could affect how you're going to invest in a company or how it'll affect your, your models. Here's one specific example. I actually took it a couple of days ago, and you can see here Boston Scientific reported on July 25th. And Facts and Fundamentals, our database was able to have this updated within a few hours of them reporting. This is something we do for all U.S. securities on a preliminary basis. So those press releases, 8K documents that they released, our goal is to get it up there within a few hours. We do the same thing for Japanese companies right now. And all U.S. document types have, have seen an increased speed. And a lot of that is due to, once again, what I was referring to at the beginning was our investment. We've really kind of enhanced a lot of our collection tools to really make this more robust, more automated, more timely, everything we can do to make sure we can get the client the data as quickly as possible. And not only is that translated to the preliminary data that I'm showing here in this screenshot, but also when a company fully reports, we've, de we've definitely done a great job of continuing to increase the standard time it takes to get the 2,000 or 3,000 unique data points that a company may report in, in their annual document and getting up to our, our database as quickly as possible. And then I think the third step, and this is really where you can do some unique investing, a unique kind of ideas with your models and test maybe some different stuff that you're not used to, is really where we're expanding our, our data and, and expanding to new items. Here are just some examples. At the top, debt capital structure. One of the things we have heard for years from our clients is, is they've always wanted to do more analysis than just the typical short-term debt and long-term debt that may be on the face of a balance sheet doing that extra due diligence and diving into what makes up that long-term and short-term debt. What kind of notes? Are they long-term notes? Are they maturing soon? Are they maturing in 20 years from now? You know, that type of uh, analysis and all that stuff is available. And then down on the bottom, really where I think one of the biggest things our clients have been asking to continue to expand is, is industry-specific metrics. And, and here are just some of the recent industries that we've added with all the unique data points. We cover airlines, retail, metals and mining, oil and gas, pharmaceutical, and hotels and gaming right now. And that is continuing to expand every, you know, every month and every quarter, we're working at adding more of those. Part of what you're seeing here is, is you can also see that you know, as we're adding these, these industry-specific metrics, we're not adding one or two data points. In the case of something like the airlines, we added 170 unique data points that you know, 
along with our research and our client demand based on our all of our clients that are, have been asking for this data, we found 170 we thought that our clients would like to see. All those are available. If you look something like hotels and gaming, the one we recently added, we added 83 unique data items. And it's, and it's on a robust universe, too. We're looking at about 450 companies that are covered globally. So it's definitely going to be a, a very deep dive in both data points and the companies might want to look at. And I think talking about this industry-specific metrics, before we jump into facts and estimates, I really wanted to show maybe a screenshot of what some of that looks like. Granted, this is what our, it might look in our application, but all this stuff has data codes that you can use through the MATLAB plugin, and you can pull all this information out. On the top, you see some examples for our hotels, and on the bottom, you're seeing some examples of, of our aircraft information. Stuff like for the hotels on top, you can see all the rooms that are in their pipeline, how many have closed, how many properties have opened to really see if this company is growing or they're slowing or where they are in their pro kind of process. And then stuff on the bottom for the aircraft, really, you know, what kind of, what are they doing going forward? Are they purchasing a lot of, of aircraft? How many commitments do they have? And, and, you know, revenue per mile and a lot of that stuff that's kind of relevant to those industries. As I was mentioning, talking about this this industry data, a good segue really goes into our facts and estimates. So with our facts and estimates, we're really talking about our historical looking. What are companies reporting? What are they putting in their 10K? You know, what has happened? The facts and estimates, we're doing a lot of this on a looking forward basis. You know, what are brokers out there who you know these companies inside and out saying about those companies? Right here, we're looking at a screenshot of all the facts that data items that we offer. And I think this is one of the extremely unique parts about this data set is this is something you're not going to find with any other third party provider. And it's just the depth that we're willing to go and to collect data uh, that brokers are making. So on the far, far left side of this, this slide, you can sort of see all the data points that exist for all sectors. It doesn't matter what kind of company it is. Stuff like your various types of EPS, which in this case, we have four or five different types to your EBITs and your EBITDAs. You know, down to stuff on your cash flow statement, like your cash flow from financing or investing or operate, operating activities. And then all the, the kind of ones on, on the right side of this, this slide are really showing all the, the sector and industry specific data points we have. Kind of jump to the next slide because it really kind of shows a little better. But right here, these are all the industry specific items we have, much like on the fundamental side, I mentioned how we have airlines and pharmaceuticals and metals and mining. Here's what we have on the forward-looking estimate basis. Banking, financial, airlines, telecom, retail, hotels, REITs, energy, and you can kind of read the rest here, but definitely a robust list. And this is something that, you, like I said, you really can't find anywhere else. And a lot of our clients who have been using it in both just their everyday analytical work or their historical backtesting have definitely got a lot of use out of it. Down below, we can see a screenshot of our application. And once again, all this stuff has data codes that you can pull through your, your MATLAB plugin that really show for Pulte Group, which is a home builder, all the unique data points that brokers are making estimates on. And as you can see, for this, they're making it on both a quarterly basis, on a fiscal year basis, they're making it multiple years out. So you can really get a lot of good work and a lot of good kind of information out of this data. And a good segue into some other estimate data that we've been we've been covering over the past couple of years is is segment specific information. So what we covered before was really diving into that specific industry and what's unique to each one of those industries. Well, here it's just what's unique to Johnson and Johnson in this case. And we're looking at all the sales revenue segments that brokers are making estimates on. So for Johnson and Johnson, you know what are they going to make from different type of drugs? What are they going to make from medical devices? both on a quarterly and a fiscal year basis looking forward. So all these have codes as well. So you definitely can pull these out. And here's just a screenshot of what it looks like in our application. As the bullet point says above, we cover at this point about 2,400 companies on a product segment basis and about 300 on a ge geographic segment basis. So that's something we've definitely been expanding you know, every, every month and every quarter. Now, finally, I really wanted to touch on you know, how you get this data. Faxit has a, an easy plugin that integrates seamlessly with MATLAB and is Windows 7 compatible. This on-demand MATLAB integration is done via our data direct technology. 
which allows MATLAB users who need financial and market data to drive their models to retrieve facts of data, such as uh, company index, economic, ownership, options, even proprietary data stored in kind of open FactSet databases. And uh, FactSet has plenty of documentation for the plugin and the data requests involved with the MATLAB integration. So this can make a very seamless and easy process for uh, you to uh, get this data. I'm now gonna hand the remainder of the presentation over to Stuart. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stephen. So now what I'd like to do is give you a real quick overview of what you can do with MATLAB and the confines are really doing a financial modeling workflow. So we think about a financial modeling workflow, it often involves importing data from a variety of different sources, if you will. An example is files, databases, or data feeds, and particularly in the case of FactSet content, it would be integrated using the data feed from FactSet. Now what you would do within MATLAB is perform a variety of different tasks, usually around researching and quantifying an idea before you can actually take like an equity trading strategy and provide it to your portfolio managers or maybe your, maybe your traders. So this can often involve data analysis and visualization, doing some exploratory data um, surveys, looking at, looking at the relationships and coming up with basically an idea or a trading strategy. Then there's more traditional financial modeling, such as the Black-Scholes equation, when you're trying to price or value options in an example or you can develop an application that you can share with other non-MATLAB users who may not be wanting to use the MATLAB environment to do an analysis, or if you have a particular workflow that you'd like to share with others. An example could be a trading application or portfolio optimization tool for portfolio managers. And then of course, there's also sharing your applications, your, your models, or even your data analysis with others. Those could be through reports, full applications to non-MATLAB users, or actually taking those algorithms, embedding them in other systems, or even full applications in other environments, such as Java. Now, one of the nice things about MATLAB is you can take this entire financial modeling workflow and use a scripting language, automate, capture, and standardize the work that you're doing within MATLAB. Let's briefly take a look at the different types of products that are available from the MathWorks that target different parts of this workflow. And of course, there's a platform product called MATLAB, which is basically underlines all the, the workflow component shown here. I'll give a brief demonstration once we jump into the first demo that will give you a brief overview of MATLAB. Now on top of that we have different components called toolboxes. These are just, dis just extensions of MATLAB or additional libraries of functions that you can use to do a variety of other tasks. In this case we have data feed where we'll be pulling data in from FactSet. You can also do similar things by pulling data from databases or even having a bi-directional link to sp spreadsheets such as Microsoft Excel. And of course, the core part of the quantitative financial modeling workflow is the, the, the algorithms around statistics, optimization, the financial modeling algorithms, the financial toolbox, as well as pricing valuation, applications of financial instruments, um, yield curve modeling, and then also economic modeling. And then of course, once you need to take your application or your algorithm or even just generate a report, there are a variety of different add-on components for that. Now the report generator allows you to, to go beyond the basic capabilities of MATLAB and generate very customized reports that fit a, a specific template that you may be using within your corporation. The ability to share your application with others comes through the MATLAB compiler and builders for Java, .NET, and Excel. Those allow you to customize your applications for those different, app, different targeted environments. There's also a new product which I'll be discussing towards the end of this presentation called the MATLAB Production Server. What that does is that allows you to host up your applications in a scalable and robust manner that can be put upon a server and hosted such to web applications, um, integrated within databases or other IT application systems. Then, of course, underneath MATLAB, there is also a parallel computing toolbox, which allows you to prototype and scale high-performance computing algorithms that take advantage of hardware, such as um, multi-core processors or GPUs. And then through the MATLAB distributed computing server, you can scale up your calculations across grids or even clouds. And then also I'll be talking about a new product towards the end of this presentation called the Trading Toolbox that was just released in 2012. This allows you to directly connect to trading systems and send trading orders to the market. Okay, so what I'd like to do is begin with my first example. Now to give a little bit of context of what we're going to do once I jump into MATLAB, we're going to be developing basically an event study. Um, this is basically going to be an example of how you can do financial modeling and analysis within MATLAB. So what we're going to do is we're going to be pulling in data from FactSet earnings data in particular, as, long, as well as some historical data. And what we're going to be looking at is whether or not the earnings announcement on a given date is good news, it's bad news, or otherwise neutral. See if we can look at the, the data and develop a strategy for taking advantage of earnings announcements. 
Now the assumption is that the market will respond according to the surprise in the earnings. So we'll make a arbitrary decision that if earnings per share results in greater than a 2.5% return after the announcement, that was good news. We'll also be looking at bad news, which is less, if the earnings per share comes in under 2.5%, that'd be considered bad news and that the market would react accordingly. Now what we're going to be looking at as a stock universe is the Dow Jones Industrial Averages. We'll be looking at five years of earnings data as well as the historical data accompanying that on a daily basis. And then the modeling approach that we're going to use is actually that from McKinley, a 1997 paper. I provide reference later in the MATLAB code. But basically what we're going to be doing is testing for abnormal returns at the event window or over the event window, which is going to be plus or minus 20 days from the earnings announcement date. And the equation below kind of shows what we're going to be using for the abnormal returns. And we'll be testing for that to see if the, the abnormal returns do exist and that they are substantial. So let me go ahead and jump into MATLAB. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the MATLAB desktop application. And during the course of this introductory example, I'll be showing you a variety of the different components of the desktop application and how you can use them to navigate through data, including importing data, looking at what data is available to you to work on, and how to apply different kind of plotting visualization tools, or even analysis routines on top of your data. So to begin with, what we want to do is basically bring in some data from FactSet. And before we do that, what I'd first like to do is define some of the stocks that we'd like to do under a variable called idea, IDS. So in the command window, I type this command here. I have in what's called a cell array, basically a listing of the different stops we'd like to, to, in, to import into MATLAB. In this case, it's going to be some tech stops, tech stocks, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and IBM. Once I hit enter, what you can see is this now defined in the workspace. Now I have a variable named ideas. It's one by four cell. If I double click on the variable, I can actually take a look at its contents. You can see that I have basically the strings of the cell of the stock names or the stock symbols that we'd like to import. Now the next step we'd like to do is actually connect to Faxit and pull in this data. So what we're going to actually do in this first example is we're going to use the Faxit command extract formula history to pull in earnings per share data. And one of the great things about MATLAB is it's an interactive environment, and you can click on different commands, or you can type help in the name of this command, for example. And it'll bring up a help window, which tells you a little bit of context about what's in there. Now, FactSet, when you subscribe to their data, also provides an additional set of libraries that you can pull back data in different formats and pre-formats them into what's called a structure within MATLAB. So when you click on the link, it brings up the basically the description of the formula history function in Mat that FactSet provides. It gives you a brief overview of how to, how to query for different things, date formats, different day conventions, quarter conventions. And then it also gives you, you know, a syntax overview of how to use a syntax in MATLAB and what each of their parameters are. So what we're going to do in this example is we're actually going to open a connection to FactSet. We're going to pass in the parameter ideas. So one of the things in MATLAB is everything is basically commands and functions. So this is basically a, an extract formula history function that takes in these inputs. We'll pass in ID, IDS, which is a listing of the stocks that I'd like information for. And then we're going to return the earnings per share report date from the current quarter back to five years ago. So we're going to be pulling quarterly data for five years. This will return in this form, in this variable, the actual reported date of the earnings. And then this will provide us the actual earnings per share reported value on the same date range. So once I go ahead and hit enter, what we'll see is that we query fact set and pull back the data. And we get a summary of telling what types of data has been brought back. And you can see that I define this in a variable called data. So if we look back over in the workspace, you can see that there's basically a one by four structure, which corresponds to the four different symbols that I asked it to return. So we can double click on it. It tells you each one of these below the, the, below the high level structure data is other structured information. So we double click on the first one, which would correspond to Apple. You can see it have a variety of other information. So I pulled back 21 different values of dates, the reporting date, and then the actual earnings per share reported. So if I double click on this, we can take a look at the earnings per share over the 21 reported quarters. Now, in addition, I can look at these variables, and let's say I want to plot earnings per share versus date. I can highlight them. And if you notice, when I select the variables, it basically gives me a listing of the different types of plots that are available for me to plot based upon the data types that I select. So I'll go ahead and select the 2D plot. Now you can see that there's a time series of the, the, the earnings per share data 
for Apple. Now the great thing about Malive is I can completely customize my workflow and capture that for later use. And as an example, we'll customize this chart. We'll basically turn the grid on, provide next label, We'll also add a Y label. And then if I like to, since this is actually quarterly data and not continuous, I can have no line and we'll just turn on symbols and we'll go ahead and fill them with a blue value. Now, now we can also go ahead and add a title. Now once I've customized the plot and it's the way I like it, I can simply go up here to File, Generate Code. What it's going to do is it's actually going to generate the MATLAB equivalent commands that can be used to generate that report. Now one, one of the things you might have noticed when I clicked on the plot command, this was a command was echoed to the command window. This is basically how to plot the data that I was looking at. What this allows you to do is use the interactive environment of MATLAB to learn different commands in MATLAB. And that's an example of using the plot. It was echoed to the command line. Now, what's in, what's in this create figure function, which was just generated from the figure, is basically all the code that is required to reproduce that figure exactly as I, I saw it earlier. And you can see the commands that are shown here. So these would be the equivalent commands you could type in the command window, or you can actually execute them from a function or script. So as an example, I can go ahead and save this. We'll just go ahead and save it as create figure. And then I can re-invoke the, the figure by sending in the sets of data that I wanted to. Now in this time, rather than use the data from the first one, let's go ahead and, and change it to be the second one. If you recall, this should be Google. So now you can see that I have a different set of data. So let me go ahead and close out of this, and we'll, we'll plot both of them next to each other. So you can see I have Apple data and Google data. So I can quickly reuse components that I did. And that was a mention before in the, the, tech, or in the financial modeling workflow, so that you can actually automate the work you're doing in MATLAB. So this allows you a way to quickly create things. If you find something that works for you or, or has a partic particular reuse in mind, such as plots, then you can create functions and automate that workflow. So now is a quick example of how you can bring data into MATLAB and quickly interactively explore it. Now in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is actually create a script that will walk you through the analysis of the, of the event study that we'd like to perform. So one of the other things that MATLAB does is it keeps track of the different commands that you created during the course of your session. So for example, let's say I wanted to go ahead and, and recreate the work I did. I can select the commands and create a script. And here I have a simple script that allows me to reproduce the work that I just did. So let's go ahead and clean up the workspace. We'll basically start from a fresh state. I'm going to show you an example of creating a real quick script. I'm going to import data. Or actually, let's go def define symbols. Import from fact set EPS data. Then let's go plot it. And one of the things I can quickly do is actually go ahead and create a figure that plots all of it by changing this to the corresponding variable. So now I can loop over all four. So one of the things you notice, these double percent signs basically allow me to break up each one of the sections of the script into cells. So I can actually interact with my script as a development and go back and rerun things. So for example, if I define this first one, I can do run selection. You can see that it redefined the initial symbols that we want to look at. I can then import the data. We're going to run this next section. And then what we'll do is we'll plot all four. Now one of the things I want to do before I do that, so it doesn't overlay, I want to create a new figure for each one. So let's go ahead and run this selection. 
which you can see now as I have some additional plots, which we can actually all dock. Now you can see I have the four different figures that we can look at. In addition, I can change the layout view. I can change the view so that we have the four, four figures like this. This allows me to quickly interact with my data, including different charts, and explore it. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to develop a more detailed script that will allow me to walk through the event study in more detail. So I'll go ahead and close this. What we're going to do is going to open the prepared script called event study that has a little bit more context to, to what's going on. So in this event study, what we're actually going to do, remember I said we would do it through the Dow Jones Industrial Average. But in the interest of time, since it takes about 15 minutes to actually process all the data and create the figures for a full Dow Jones Industrial Average, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look an example here for Apple, Google, Microsoft, and IBM. And then I'll show you a generated report for these components of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And you also notice that I have two different kind of comments included in my script. Now the first one is a cell. So the cell one is defines this as a cell, and these are additional comments that can be included within your script. And you can see that these comments are describing a little bit more about what's going on within the nature of my analysis routine. And then I can also collapse them so I can look at them in a little bit more detail and make it easier to look at. So what we're going to actually do is we're going to go ahead and clean up my workspace again and start the analysis over. This time we can say start with this original, this, the same procedure that we did before. Now we're going to use a run advanced, which will advance to the next cell. Now this next cell is actually taking advantage of a, new, of a different kind of data set besides the structure. It's called a data set array. And what the data set array is allows you to, con to store your data in a more convenient syntax that you can actually index by name. So let me go ahead and run this selection. Then let's take a look at the data set array. So it was stored in a variable called event data. And what we can see here is that I basically have different things called ID, earnings per share, or earnings per share date. So that's the reported date, and then this is the actual earnings per share value. And one of the nice things about a data set array is I can index by name. So for example, I can return everything for earnings per share only. OK, so we'll return here. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to calculate the, the maximum and the minimum date, or the starting date and the end date of all the historical data we're going to need to pull back from FactSet. And what we want to do is we want to look at the earnings per share date, and then we want to look plus or minus 20 days in the study that we'll be doing. We're going to be pulling back a few extra days in case it lands upon a weekend, so we can make sure we can capture a full 20 days of data. Now this will give us plus or minus 25 days around the, the, the minimum and the maximum earnings per share date. And then one of the things we want to do in the case of, for example, Apple, which just recently had an earnings announcement, and it hasn't been 20 days since that announcement, we want to make sure that the maximum date we have can be no greater than today. So if any of the dates come back greater than today, we're going to actually define them as today. Now what we'll do using FactSet is we're actually going to return all of the symbols for the stocks that we were interested in before, and we're also going to include the benchmark of the S&P 500. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically define the dates in this month, day, year for format, return daily data that's going to be passed into the formula for fact set, which in this case you can create strings by concatenating them between the square brackets. So this way you can structure things so that I can change the, the different symbols I'm looking at and quickly rerun my analysis at a future date if I need to, or over a different set of um, symbols. So we'll use the same command as before and pull back all the data. This will take a second as it's pulling all the, all the, the data. And one of the things we can look at is the data that's being pulled back here is a 1 by 5 structure, but now it contains the price and also the returns, the price returns. Now, the, the, the facts at global estimate, or the facts at global price data here is actually the earnings per share, or is actually adjusted price, so we can use this to calculate total returns. So what we're going to do is we now have a couple different data sets. We have this new data in data, which actually contains a time series data. So for example, if we want to press 
plot those two, you can take a look at the SM. Oops, excuse me. Let's go ahead and select the eight because it's sensitive to the order. So this is the the, the SMP 500 index historical data that we're looking at over what is a date time vector in MATLAB. So if I wanted to convert that simply to a date string representation, I issue the command date tick, which will then give me the the equivalent date in in a, a textual format. So now I can take a look at the SMP 500 data. I can also add the different data here as well. But what we want to do is we want to take data. We want to merge it with event data so that we have this all within one data container. And that's what we're doing within the next next set of cells here is we're going to take the event data and join it with data. And then we're going to go ahead and plot it. So now what you can see is that I've actually done a few things. So let me go back here real quick. So if you look at the, the commands here, I've got the plot, we're going to add a legend, we're doing the date tick, and then I've got a function called recession plot from the econometrics toolbox, which if with no inputs will actually define all the recessions within the industry. But what I'm doing that is actually shade the event window, plus or minus 20 days around the earnings per share date, which is defined here. These are what are denoted in the gray bars is basically the earnings per share date, or the earnings announcement date, plus with the window of plus or minus 20 around that event. So we can quickly look in and see what's happening on to our benchmark, which is the S&P 500, as well as the, the different stocks that we're looking at. And one of the things is we can zoom in and take a look at what's happening around an earnings per share date. So let me go ahead and turn the grid on. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and zoom in, for example, to Google around the earnings per share date. So in this example, it doesn't look like there's a substantial change. Some of the other earnings per share dates, so you can see in the middle, like this one would be about the middle of the earnings per share window. It does look like that there was an event that occurred here. So what we want to do is we actually want to test the hypothesis that if the news is good, that, the, that there will be a surprise uptick in, the inter, in, time, in terms of the return, as well as the return is bad. And we're going to follow kind of the, the McKinley analysis procedure for estimating the, the, the abnormal returns. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to do that in the next cell. So what we want to do is extract all of the event locations that's in this time series data and be able to overlay them on top of each other. And what we're doing is just generating an index of all the different events through all the different symbols here. And then, this, then the next step is to really, we want to estimate the market returns. We want to take an estimate of what the S&P 500 is doing, which is basically the return equal to an alpha times the, the beta relative to the market, um, plus some noise. So we're going to be looking at, at calculating returns for all the, the, the market and all of the different components. And basically, that's what we're doing here. And we're doing it for each of the windows defined earlier using index. So we have an alpha model, a beta model. This is for the market. And then what we're doing is, if it's within a window, we're also going to estimate the, the abnormal returns, which is defined earlier on the slide. But basically, it's the abnormal returns is basically the current return minus what would be calculated from the market model, which we calibrated up here earlier. So we're going to do this for each of the windows, and then we're going to plot that data. So let me go ahead and run this section of code. So this will take a little bit of time as it's going through each one of the event windows and processing the data for Google, Microsoft, Apple, and IBM. OK, now we can see the results that have, have come across. What we're looking at here is basically the calculation of the beta um, on a daily basis for each one of the instruments. And one of the interesting things is you can see that there's roughly an average for the different beta components seem to oscillate around this value. Now, if you're interested in beta arbitrage or looking at, at, at um, developing a dynamic trading strategy, you can actually use this mean reverting process of the betas around kind of an average value. So when the beta goes high, you can short the stock because you expect the beta to come down. When it goes low, you can you can buy the stock and so forth. But we just want to take a look at the betas and see how they're varying over time with this plot. Now, the next thing we want to do is actually take the calculations of the market model and the abnormal returns, and then we're going to aggregate them into something called the cum cumulative abnormal return. And basically, the cumulative abnormal return, or CAR, is essentially an average. So it's a summation average of the abnormal returns across each security, across time, so for the same day. So we're going to be creating 
a car for day zero as an example, day one, day two, day three, all the way to plus or minus 20 around the event day. And we're going to use this to kind of take a look at the data and see that there is a statistical evidence that events do move the market or that there is a trading strategy that you can adopt. So what we're doing in this first part of the cells, we're, we're creating a lot of variables that we're going to be using in a loop. And in the loop, what we're doing is over each event, we're going to be categorizing the news. And here's how we categorize it, is if the, if the return on that day um, following the news release was greater than 2.5%, we're going to call it good news. If it was less than 2.5%, we're going to call it bad news. We're going to loop over every one of the days. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to actually calculate or aggregate the abnormal returns, and then we're going to plot the return price as well for each one. And then, then towards the end, we're going to actually provide a numeric summary of the good car, bad car, and what's called a neutral car, so the news events. So let's go ahead and run this, which is going to create a bunch of individual plots for all the different instruments we're looking at. As you can see in figure one, we have Apple. You can see that we've normalized the event around day zero, so that the price would be zero. And then this is the price return, um, or the percentage change in the price as time from the event. So you can see before the event, kind of the distribution of, of returns coming into it, and after the event. So what we need to do is actually break apart the different components of what was good, which is bad, and which is neutral. And we need to do that for each of the different components. We can see one for Microsoft, similar effect. Apple, Microsoft, IBM, and Google. Now, one of the interesting things about Google is that there was an earnings release that happened earlier before the actual earnings date that was leaked to the market. And if you recall, um, it looks like this might have actually been, been off by a day. So the official reporting date may be off by a day. So we might actually need to adjust one of the time series. But for the sake of brevity in this um, example, we're just going to go ahead and assume that this is an actual data set and average the values in. So this might skew up some of the averages um, on the negative side in this particular example. So let me just go ahead and close all the windows. And what we're going to do now is we're going to actually plot the, the final results, which is we're going to take the average of all the good cars. And the NAN mean here just means that the, if there's missing data denoted as a NAN in MATLAB, we're, we're not going to include that in the average. We're going to do the NAN mean for the neutral and the NAN mean for the bad cars. And if we do that, what we can see is the plot. It gives us basically the cumul cumulative abnormal returns over time from the event window plus for the good news, neutral news, and bad news. One of the things you can see is the neutral news does appear to be fairly flat, so the news did not tend to provide any new information, so the returns didn't seem to be abnormal above and beyond what was already happening within the market. So keep in mind that cumulative abnormal returns is relative to what the mark was going on within the market as we define as the S&P 500 in this example. Now for good news, what we can see is that on average, you get about almost a 5% return for good news after the day of the event. So if the earnings per share is a surprise, on average in the market, you're going to see about a 5% return um, based upon the earnings surprise being good news. Now, alternatively, you can also see what happens when there's bad news. You see that there's also an instantaneous return for the day after the event of around almost minus 4% to minus 4.5%. So you can see it's actually fairly symmetric on average that the returns can be plus or minus 5% depending upon the outcome of the news. Now, one of the other interesting things is that the, the abnormal returns does not look like it continues much after the first day. So this would be the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, and fifth day. So really within the first day or so, the market has responded and, act, and actually arbitraged away any of that additional information. So it does not appear that this in additional information does a lot to improve the price beyond the initial announcement. So this is, this is a suggestion that the markets are truly efficient, or at least efficient in terms of a short time frame. Now, one of the other things you may want to do is actually extend the analysis shown here um, and actually include um, fact set estimates or um, fact set consensus data. So one of the things we're going to do here is I'm going to show you real quickly how you can calculate and get estimates for the consensus data. So a command here called fact set estimates consensus will return the earnings per share data. We're going to look at Apple for 723 2013 we're going to use the current fiscal period. The period type will be quarterly, so we're going to return quarterly. And we're also going to be comparing it to 30 days prior 
and we'll be looking at the previous data. So this is going to return, fetch from FactSet, a consensus on the FactSet estimates of the earnings per share data, and return it into a data structure. And what you can see is that the data will give you um, the facts that mean, so this is the, the consensus mean around the earnings per share. So the earnings per share of Apple would have been around 7.9. Um, in the previous 30 days, it was about 8.26, so it was revised down. Now this is a way that you can also take a look at facts at earnings estimates and maybe include that into model to try and forecast whether there will be a surprise or not. Or, a sense, or essentially you can use that as input into a model to determine whether or not there will be a good or bad news, or maybe neutral news. Now, I'll leave that as an exercise, but one of the things I wanted to leave you with before we go into the next example is that everything in this, this command is easily reusable and, and customizable, and I can change the inputs and outputs. So one of the things I said before is we would actually do this sort of Dow Jones Industrial Average. Since it takes a little bit of time to run, um, I'm going to show you, show you how this works, basically through the Apple. But we'd uncomment this line and run it through, the, through for the whole event. Let me go ahead and publish the report that's going to show you, or it's going to redo the analysis I just did here. So let me go ahead and clean up my workspace. It's going to redo the analysis through this entire script, um, take all the figures generated, and capture them into an HTML report in this case. Now one of the things I can also do is change the report format. If I didn't want a uh, HTML report format, I could do it in XML, a LaTeX document, PDFs, and so on. So the other thing to note is that each one of the cells now are going to become a header section of my report, and that this comment, that the data contained within the comments, will actually become the text of my report. So I'm going to go ahead and actually open up the one for the full Dow Jones Industrial Average while we're waiting for the current one to publish. OK, so what we're looking at here is an HTML report of the event study basically consisting of the same analysis I did before, but instead of using the, the Apple, Google, and Microsoft, we actually are running it over the 30 components of the Dow Jones Industrial Average defined here. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the calculations that were done for estimating normal returns. You can see here all the components of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, um, the calculations that were done individually. You can see this is for Alcoa, and you can continue to go through the different components and take a look. They all look pretty similar. That there, that there is a, a cone basically um, after the event for the, now these are actually plotting the abnormal returns or the total total normalized returns. So this is the price based all normalized to, to the time of the event. They all look fairly similar. You can quickly browse through and see if there are any that have anomalies in them. Maybe some that we need to go back and modify. For an example, Johnson & Johnson had an event here. There also looks like there was an event in this data set, which is actually included in our earnings per share um, event study, which may or may not be um, correct. We need to go back and look at the data and see if there was an additional event or different kind of news event that caused the, the different kinds of abnormal returns here that might be skewing our analysis. Um, but if we just go ahead and use the analysis as is, over the Dow Jones 30, we can see for the most case that many of these don't seem to have really um, a lot of abnormal returns, particularly around the event. Um, some have a little bit more noise than others. And going down here, basically, we can see the, the same kind of result. Now, remember, we just ran the event study for four stocks before, Apple, IBM, Google, and Microsoft. Um, and in this case, that one had about a 5% return. Now, using the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it seems to be about a little bit lower, about 4% um, cumulative average return. For, for good news and similarly for that. But you can see that using more stocks, we've actually lowered the variance um, around before and after the event. So now we can get a better measure. And in particular, you can really look at the, um, the neutral news seems to be relatively flat. So if there's no new information, there is not a large abnormal return of the market. That's pretty much captured by the noise um, of the market anyways. But leading up to the event, it does seem to be higher volatility or more noise to the return series. And then in particular, if it's good or bad, you'll see, see a spike um, just after the earnings announcement. OK, so that concludes this example. Now what I'd like to do is return the slides real quick and kind of set up the, the next example that we'll be looking to walk through. OK, so to conclude, what we basically did is we performed an event study to kind of test our hypothesis that there are abnormal returns around the earnings announcements. We can see clearly from the chart on the right that there were for you to try out in MATLAB if you so wish. 
but I'd like to continue on now with kind of our second example today, which is how do you create customized applications in MATLAB um, that you can then share with others that will encapsulate workflows that you do repetitively into, into something more advanced than a simple um, script or published report. And what we're really going to be looking at here is kind of a traditional uh, portfolio optimization application. So we'll really be going into a mean variance optimization. And the goal of this example is to show you how you can take a script and transform it into an application that you can then reuse. So with that, let me quickly go back to MATLAB. And this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open up another prepared script to kind of walk you through the analysis procedure for developing a portfolio optimization strategy with facts of data in MATLAB. And then I'll show you quickly how you can kind of componentize it and then um, create an application around it. So the script here basically does a portfolio analysis. And as before, we're going to, re we're going to pull in data. This time, we're going to return pull in the total return series with cumulative, um, so basically the total return series with dividends um, reinvested is basically what this command is doing. And we're going to compile all the components of the DAO. Then what we're going to do is we're going to extract the asset list. We're going to go ahead and plot the total return data just to look at the data that came back. So we can quickly take a look and see how our total return data came in from 2011 to 2013 across all the components of the DAO. So to set up a traditional mean variance optimization in MATLAB, there's, there's a convenient function called the portfolio. Now the portfolio object takes, now the portfolio function takes as inputs the asset list and a risk-free rate, which we're going to define as 2.7%, but we're going to normalize that on a monthly basis. Because if you recall, what we're doing here is we're actually returning the data on a monthly basis, not daily in this particular instance. So we create a portfolio object. What we can see is P has a variety of different, different properties. And these are essentially different things you can add to your portfolio optimization. Now, there are a variety of different things that you can do, such as turnover costs, inequality constraints. You can set different bounds. You can even group them. There's a lot of things you can do with the portfolio object, but we're going to use just kind of the standard um, mean variance optimization with standard budget constraints. So we'll allow you to long or short the, the actual portfolio. Now, in addition, the portfolio object itself allows you a variety of different methods that you can do that simplify many tasks you might want to do with portfolio optimization. And one of the things we'll be showing here in a minute is how you can estimate the efficient frontier for a portfolio, or even what the sharp ratio, uh, maximum sharp ratio portfolio might be. Now these are convenience functions that allow you to, to, to basically extract information from a portfolio rather quickly um, and make simplifying developing portfolio strategies in MATLAB fairly simple. So if we go ahead and and execute the next one, which is basically we're just going to define an initial portfolio of equally weighted. We're going to estimate the portfolio moments. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plot the efficient frontier. Or we're going to plot a scatter plot of all that data before we actually calculate the efficient frontier. Let's go and define the initial portfolio, equally weighted. Then we're going to go ahead and plot it. So what we've done here is plotted an equally weighted portfolio along with the returns for along with all the standard deviation on an annualized basis and the mean returns for all the different assets in the Dow Jones universe. And we've labeled them here, so you can actually go through and zoom in and take a look at a variety of the different components that are, on, that are plotted here. So I'm going to go ahead and dock this, because we'll be reusing this um, plot here in a few more. So what we're going to do is set default constraints as so a standard portfolio optimization. We're going to actually estimate the frontier using 20 points, and then we're going to take those those portfolio weights, and then we're going to go ahead and plot them. So if I go ahead and run this section of code, what we're going to do is we're going to see the efficient frontier plotted. Now this is the standard mean variance. Now one of the things we want to do is if we wanted to pull off a particular target or return, we can easily do that using the convenience functions provided with the portfolio object. So for example, let's go ahead and pull a target return portfolio and a target risk portfolio of 15% and 20%. We can do that using the estimate portfolio frontier by return, and then simply plot them as we did before. Or the 15% risk, and then the 20% target return on an annualized basis with our universe. But the one thing that's great about the portfolio object that I showed you um, before is there's a lot of different things you can do to add turnover constraints, transaction costs, and you can even set up a variety of different fund structures, such as dollar neutral or 130-30 funds. So in this example, we're going to set up a 130-30 fund, which basically means I'm going to sell short 30% of the stocks in my investment portfolio and reinvest that 30% to go long 130% in other stocks. 
So the way to do that is we'll just define a leverage ratio. And then we set the bounds. We just set them for, you know, minus the leverage for we'll go short and we'll go long 130. And then we'll define the turnover constraints for a 130-30 portfolio. And then much of the commands are the same about creating the plots. So we'll go ahead and run that. And what you can see now is that we have the efficient frontier for the standard portfolio, the 130-30. And we've actually also estimated the sharp ratio off the 130-30 portfolio. So this is an example of how you can quickly create portfolio optimization strategies in MATLAB. Now let's say you wanted to actually take these and take the graphical user interface real quickly. So one of the things you can do is I'm just going to go ahead and create a default one um, using the guide or the graphical user interface de design environment. And what this allows you to do is quickly create graphical tools by adding components and then running them. So an example here, let's go ahead and save it. So go ahead and creates the, the MATLAB function for callbacks for anything tied to what happens here. So for example, if I change this to sign and updated it, it would have a callback that would basically say when this changes and I hit the update function, um, change the plot. So this is an example of how you can quickly create a variety of different um, graphical user interfaces within MATLAB. And you can see here that all the functions contained, so when I hit the update button, for example, it's going to call. So for example, I can take a look at this and look at the callback function, which is the push button one callback. And if I go back to the, the function that was generated, the push button one callback, basically defines the different plot types for the different selections available in the drop-down menu. So that's an example of how you can quickly create a graphical user interface in MATLAB. And what I want to do is actually go ahead and open one that was created earlier. It's a little more sophisticated, but it actually goes through the whole process that we discussed earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, and run one called the Portfolio Tool and just show you quickly how this works, and then walk through the process of how you can create an app that you can package and share with others. So we go ahead and run the portfolio tool. And we'll go ahead and take a look at the portfolio optimization tool. Now what this allows you to do is actually walk through the procedure of setting up a portfolio optimization routine. So the first step is the data import. So I'll go ahead and import data from FactSet. We're going to download the Dow Jones Industrial Components. One of the things you can also notice is that there's an S&P 500 option here. So you can see all the components that are available to me, including the, 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 the index itself and all the constituents. We're going to go ahead and select all. Let's take a look at um, data from 2009 to 2013. Go ahead and download those prices from FactSet. Whoops, error in my format. So we can actually define the benchmark is in the first column, the dates, or we can accept all the data. And one of the other things you can do now is I'm, I'm, provide, I'm provided a representation showing um, the return series. So I can change this to logarithmic returns if I would like to calculate portfolios based upon that. I can use exponentially weighted returns. Um, but for example, we're just going to go ahead and use a standard portfolio using standard weighted returns. Once I hit Compute Efficient Frontier. What I get is basically the Efficient Frontier calculation, and then I can select a given portfolio. So for example, you can see the variety of metrics that are here. I can take a look at the selected portfolio compared to the benchmark Dow Jones Industrial Average, what's involved in that portfolio, the portfolio weights. The risk-free rate in this case is defined as 2%. I can look at a, a variety of key metrics, such as even tracking area relative to the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And I can take a look at the, the monthly value at risk on a historical basis, or I can use a parametric fit as well. I can also do this and look at a variety of different ones. So each one I can look up comes across interactively as I explore my portfolio options. Now let's say I went and, go, went and found a portfolio that I'm interested in. I can actually select Generate Report here. And what this is going to do is open up an Excel and generate a customized report and import all of the data and figures that are, are part of that application. And then it's actually going to take this and publish it to a PDF report that I can share with others. Or I can share the Excel report if that's even more convenient with your end users. 
we can see that the report now is almost done. It's completing the last section, pulling in the last key metrics, the charts, the value at risk measure, and now you can see basically a PDF report showing the results of my investigation. So that's an example of creating a portfolio optimization application in MATLAB. And we're going to talk about how you can take an example portfolio optimization application, for example, and share that with other users through a web-based interface. So if we turn, just to summarize what we just did in MATLAB, I created a simple portfolio application that allows you to quickly encapsulate the workflow you do in MATLAB, share with other MATLAB users who may not be familiar with your particular analysis technique, routines, or functions, as well as share them with other um, non-MATLAB users using our compiler tools, or compiler and deployment tools. Now, the other example I'd like to do is go a little bit beyond kind of a standard desktop application and show you how you can share your application through the web. Um, in this particular application, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take a look at an asset allocation example with a web interface as shown here. It's actually going to do something similar to the portfolio tool that we showed earlier, but this case is going to be slightly different and use a slightly different set of data. But before I go about showing you that example application, I just want to give you a quick overview of kind of the components that were required behind this to make this work since it is a web-based application. You could have multiple users hitting the application at the same time. So how do you handle that with MATLAB? So what, we, what allows you to do that is, is a new product called the MATLAB production server. And what it really allows you to do is scale up your calculations and host them to multiple simultaneous users at the same time. What that really has is a production server, which basically allows you to, to broker requests to the calculations that are going on all within MATLAB. And it scales that and manages that based upon MATLAB programs and worker pools. So you have a variety of different components up and running. You can have multiple different calculations. They can all be using different different workers. And it's really scalable um, in terms of the number of users that can hit the server. So the runtime library itself is the MATLAB compiler runtime. It's the same runtime that's used in the desktop deployed applications. Um, or the way to think of it is it's, it's the headless version of MATLAB without the desktop. Or another way to think of it is if, you, if you're familiar with Java, the Java runtime and jar files run on top of that. So it's essentially the same model. Here's we're going to create what's called a CTF file that runs on top of the MATLAB compiler runtime. And what interfaces into the production server is a, is a lightweight client library from .NET or Java, or the two that are currently supported. And basically, you just call them as if they're functions on the client library. So if we return back to the architecture for that web-based example that I'll be showing here in a minute, there are basically three components to that that I'm not really going to go through in detail. But essentially, there's a client component that's defined here. So this is actually the definition of the web front end and the calling mechanisms that call back. So basically, an example is when you, you update a portfolio of your, of your inputs, it's going to submit a request to the web server. The web server is going to submit requests to the production server that's either going to initiate a new session, um, do other things like compute frontier, or do visualization of the component of the portfolios, or even compute statistics, and then it's going to return that as a as a results page. And on the results page, you can actually interactively select the different portfolios, like we did in the portfolio tool earlier. If you select a portfolio, it's going to go back and and, and request these different components that are going to be returned um, to the results page. Is basically, I'm going to go ahead and start my web server. So my web server is, is currently started. Um, called the, the the MATLAB production server instance manager. So let me go ahead and invoke this. We're going to go ahead and start up a, a, a version of the MATLAB production server. Let me load a previous save configuration, which happens to be in the C. MATLAB directory, production server instance. This is a, a 64 based, and then my web asset allocation. So I'll go ahead and select this folder. And what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and load the components. Now, one of the things about the production server is that you can see that it's currently stopped. Um, and now there are a variety of different parameters that I can set. And the number of workers here is four. That basically allows you the number of simultaneous calculations that we calculate at the same time. It's four on this particular machine because I have a four core um, laptop. But if you had a, at a you know an actual server machine, you can you can beef that up to 12 or 24 or even more depending upon your particular needs. But we're just going to use four here. One thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and start the production server. Okay, so now we can see that the production server has started and start up a web interface. 
Now here's here's what the application actually looks like with the front end. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to define initial portfolio, which basically has these different kinds of indices that you can include in your portfolio. I can add min or max allowable limits. I can define an initial portfolio if I wish. If you choose a default, it's just going to start with zero, and then you can choose one. Now in addition to the standard portfolio optimization, I can also use conditional value at risk um, optimization. So let's go ahead and choose that one this time. We're going to go ahead and include a... Uh, and we'll just go ahead and optimize it. So you can also see the history of the index shown here, which are graphics generated from MATLAB. So you can see the historic return statistics for each of the assets that we're looking at in my portfolio, as well as a heat map. It kind of shows you the historic correlation between the asset returns. So I'll give you a quick view of the data. Now let's go ahead and optimize this. We'll change that to 3%. And then we'll go ahead and optimize the portfolio. Okay, so now what you can see is the return of the results, which basically shows me portfolio allocation based upon a standard deviation, not actually the conditional value risk portfolio risk return here, but the equivalent um, efficient frontier, and then the annualized return. As before, you can see that I'm selecting this portfolio, you get a pie chart of the distribution, the table of some of the metrics. And then in addition to that, I can look at the history, as well as a fan chart that shows kind of the, the expected performance going forward into the future. As before, I can select a different portfolio, and you can see that these charts update and I get different results. This allows me to build a web-based application, very similar, using the same kinds of technologies and components that are used in the desktop application. Now this is one of the advantages of using MATLAB, is you can rapidly prototype um, an application and then integrate these into a variety of different front-end systems, whether that be an Excel spreadsheet, um, a web-based application, or a desktop application, or a Java or .NET um, component. So if we turn to the webinar, remember we talked about the financial modeling workflow. There are a variety of different tools called toolboxes in MATLAB that allow you to extend the basic capabilities of MATLAB. In the example we showed today, we used statistics, optimization, for the portfolio optimization and financial toolbox. Um, we did use econometrics briefly for the recessions plot, but we, we did build an application for the production server. And then the last thing I want to do is, is introduce you to the trading toolbox, which is a relatively new toolbox um, that allows you to actually send and execute trades from directly from within MATLAB. So what does that really do? Well, basically, the trading toolbox is a market access toolbox. It allows you to connect to a variety of different exchanges or markets, um, in particular through desktop trading system applications that are currently supported. So you can do a variety of different things, such as create risk engines that can connect to the markets and do hedging, that allow you to do hedging and trading directly through the markets. You can do pricing engines that allow you to price different options, different financial instruments, such as swaps or credit default swaps, and then even hedge them within the market. And then a trading engine, which like the portfolio optimization, could also be another algorithmic trading application with direct access to the market. And you can either, either trade in an automated fashion, where MATLAB can send them the orders to the market in an automated way, or you can create applications where the end user can then authorize trades to be done into the market. So in conclusion, some of the additional research you can find is, the, is the, the white paper that was shown in the agenda slide can be found in this first link here from the Faxit integration with MATLAB. There's a listing of some other trading related webinars that may be of interest to you that you can find out more information on how to use MATLAB to develop trading strategies or even do more advanced trading um, applications. And those are all available on our, on, our, on our website. If you go to mathworks.com and then navigate to webinar section, you'll be able to find it. And then as well, I'd like to point you to some industry presentations which show a variety of different people from around industry using MATLAB for a variety of different types of applications. Um, these can be found basically on the links there. We had a computational finance conference in New York recently this year and one from last year in London. An example screenshot of some of the videos available can be seen on the right. So that basically concludes the webinar for today. Thank you.